Looking to sound like you know what's going on in the world? Pop culture, social strategy, comedy, and other funny stuff? Well, join the club and settle in for the Jeff Dwoskin Show. It's not the podcast we deserve, but the podcast we all need with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Bill. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 102 of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Duoskin Show. As always, I am your host, Jeff Duoskin. Great to have you back as we start to climb this second set of 100 episodes with our eyes on 200 and beyond. Today, I have a very special guest for you, comedian, writer, and director hailing from Detroit, Michigan. Mike Binder is here today. That's right. Director and writer of the Comedy Store documentary. Writer and star of The Mind of the Married Man. Director and writer of Rain Over Me. Black or White. Indian Summer. The Sex Monster. We talk about so much in this amazing interview. Mike Binder is a comedic force to be reckoned with and we have an amazing chat and that is coming up in just a few minutes. I do want to thank everyone that reached out with congratulations during the 100th episode week. Such an exciting week. Episode 100 with Ronnie Cox. And special shout out to Casey Ryan Plot. If you haven't listened to the Ronnie Cox episode yet, go listen. The interview is amazing. But also, before the interview and after the interview, there's a party scene with a ton of celebrity voices wishing me well and some great dialogue. I did that with Casey Ryan Plot, extremely talented voice artist. So check that out. I also want to thank Jackie the Joke Man Martling for visiting me on the bonus episode of Crossing the Streams. For the first ever Celebrity Edition. If you're a celebrity and you've been on the show and want to join me on a Celebrity Edition of Crossing the Streams, have your people call my people. And now it's time for the social media tip. All right, this is the part of the show I love where I get to share a little bit of my social media knowledge with you. A little 411 I picked up on the street. Something I can make you aware of and then you can dive deeper into if it is of interest to you. I've been in the social media game for a long time and I love sharing tips and things that I hear so we can all raise our social media game together. Recently, an email came in telling me that if I buy Twitter Blue, I can put an NFT as my profile picture. Well, one, I don't have Twitter Blue, but two... I also don't have an NFT, but if I get Twitter blue, I can add an NFT. So that's interesting. Evolution of Twitter. An NFT is a non-fungible token. You know, whatever. I just knew that without Googling it. (laughs) It's a unique digital item, such as artwork, and that you own that. So it's yours. So you can show off your profile picture by connecting your crypto wallet to your Twitter account. Then it shows in a hex-shaped profile picture. So you can really shove it in people's faces that not only do you have Twitter blue, but you also have an NFT. You can throw that swag around. It's kind of cool. So I would, one thing it means we all need to start learning what NFTs are. If you're looking for an NFT to add, my friend at Jen Ficino, Jen Ficino, at the Dick Picks NFT, the D-I-C-K-P-I-X NFT. You, you can buy one of her pixelated Dick Picks. She has 777 hand-drawn dicks that you can choose from. Sounds like the perfect profile picture if you ask me. So head over to my friend and artist Jen Ficino. She also has a podcast. You can check that out. So if you're looking for an NFT, there's a place to start. There you go. I've combined a new feature on Twitter, a little bit of NFT chatter, and was able to promote my friend Jen Facino. And that's the social media tip. I do want to thank everyone in advance for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Live from Detroit, the Jeff DeWaskin Show. And that's how we keep the lights on. Today's interview sponsor is StandUpWorld.com, the most important bookmark in stand-up history. History. All the stand-up comedy news, stand-up comedy lists, and stand-up comedy sites aggregated because you are lazy. That's right, the best in comedy news, right at your fingertips. Lists of all your favorite comedian podcasts, their tour dates, Instagram comedy, the best in YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, and vinyl. It's all there at StandUpWorld.com. Head over to it, put together lovingly by Mike Binder. It's the site he talks about at the end of our interview, which hadn't been completed yet, but now it exists. So head on over to StandUpWorld.com. 
but not before you listen to my amazing conversation with the writer director of Black and White, The Upside of Anger, Rain Over Me, The Sex Monster, Indian Summer, creator of the amazing Comedy Store documentary, and I'm barely scratching the surface, Mike Binder. Enjoy. All right, everyone, excited to introduce you to my next guest, writer, director, comedian, Detroit legend, Mike Binder. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Great to have you. Oh, man, it's, um, I've got so much to ask you and talk about. I've been doing a Mike Binder film festival as a ramp up to this, and I do want to get out of the way early. Indian Summer is like one of my favorite movies. One of my favorite movies. Love it. I'm not a Tamakwa guy. I'm a Tamarack guy, but I love it. You know, the feeling of the camp. If you told me you were a Tamarack guy, I would have brought some different stuff to wear on the show because I have some Tamarack stuff. Do you? Yeah. I'm sure it's the like, Tamakwa people like, won't be I happy. used to always call it our bizarro world. <laughs> was bizarro camp. Somebody gave me all this Tamarack stuff. It was really funny. A friend of mine. I would always tease Tamarack, especially when I was like playing in the very early days at Mark Ridley's first comedy club in the basement at the meeting place. I think that's what it was called at Orchard Lake and um, Middle Belt or something or other. But the very first comedy castle was in there and I would make all these Tamarack jokes and that's the only place it ever worked. (laughs) (laughs) Did I read correctly that you were the first headliner for Mark Ridley? Yeah, yeah. I was. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. really, that's a nice little uh, footnote. Yeah. And Dave Coulier was the opening act. Dave. I love Dave. That might have been my second time there, but Dave Coulier, that's how I first met Dave. He was my opening act there. And he killed. One night he killed. I couldn't even follow him. He's awesome. I opened for him at the Comedy Castle. It was one of the few times like I was like a bit starstruck. <laughs> I could not get a word out talking to Dave Coulier. And of like the second night he says to me, we're in the, you know, about to walk, you know, where you'd walk on stage behind the stage. And he says to me, Hey Jeff, you going to be around after the show? And I'm thinking to myself, Oh my God, Dave wants to hang <laughs> out with me. And I said, yeah. And he says, great here, here's my merchandise. Could you make sure that the MC ah, gets it? <laughs> I, was like, that's hysterical. I was like crushed. I was crushed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I'm leaving the comedy castle. I'll tell you what, that's so unlike Dave, though, because I thought it, I was going to say, yeah, of course he wanted to hang out with you. That's Dave. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he did. I was just, it was just in that moment. Because when I was leaving, he was really cool. When I was leaving, he was like, bye, Jeff. And I turned and all I could go through my head was, oh, my God, Dave Cooley remembered my name. And I smashed into the door in front of him as I was leaving uh, while he was selling merch. So that was my uh, exciting <laughs> moments with Dave. Well, just before I reached out to you, I watched the Comedy Store documentary, which I loved. It was great. It took me a while to finally watch it because I didn't have Showtime, and it was getting embarrassing. It's on Amazon and Hulu, then it's going to be on Netflix. Oh, fantastic. So more people will be able to see it. Yeah, because I kept interviewing, like I was talking to Rich Scheidner or Steve Bluestein, and like, and I was like, oh, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> they all kept talking about how great it was. So it was great, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But I'd love to kind of... What's your origin story? Like, when did you know you wanted to get into comedy? Because you were a comedian before you were a writer, director, before you were making movies. So that's kind of the path. How did you know when comedy was going to be your destiny? Oh, really young. Really, really young. My dad told me that I was watching the Ed Sullivan show when I was a kid, like seven or eight years old. And Woody Allen came on and I, I turned around and I said, what's he doing? What, is, what do you call that? Because that's what I want to do. That's awesome. Yeah. And then also I lived at Seven Mile in Livernois, not far from Baker's Keyboard Lounge, which was Eight Mile in Livernois. And we were riding our bikes and Lenny Bruce was playing at Baker's and it said Comic Lenny Bruce on the sign. And I remember I must have been like six or seven. And I remember asking my dad, I said, what is what does that mean? Comic Lenny Bruce? Because I thought it was like Sunday comics. And he said, no, that's the comedian. He's a comedian. And then he told me what a comedian does. And I thought, that's a great job. I love to make people laugh, even as a young kid. Every time I would see a guy on television, because I wasn't allowed to stay up to watch The Tonight Show or anything like that. But every time I would see anything to do with a funny guy, it just sucked me in in an incredible way. 
I was just obsessed with comedy and stand-up comedy from a really a bizarrely young age. You know, I was doing it when I was 16 years old. Where were you doing it at 16? Oh, uh, any place I could get up on stage, talent shows, and I would steal a lot of Woody Allen's album stuff. I remember I would go up to Ann Arbor and go ask guys at jazz clubs if I could go on. And, and then Dave and I, years later, this was like, I'm trying to remember when this was, but we, we would do like the student union at, in Ann Arbor. I would play places called the Pretzel Bell and just nutty places up there. Anywhere you could get into. Anywhere I could get on, yeah. You were pretty motivated then. I was just talking with John Heffron, and he would do the same thing at Eastern Michigan University. And Yeah, he actually, his mother worked for my dad. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I knew his mother for a long time. She was my dad's secretary. Oh, small world. Yeah. Do you know John Glazer? John Glazer, no. John's a comedian. He was on Parks and Rec. And he was on, he wrote for Conan for a long time. The only reason, he's a Detroit guy too, but oh, he yeah? was a Tamarack guy. Well, that's why I don't know. <laughs> so in the Comedy Store documentary, and I've heard you say this other places as well, you said uh, going to the Comedy Store and being at the Comedy Store was your college education. But you mean that literally, right? Because I read that yeah. you actually left college and headed to LA. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't even go to college in here. I went to LA and I, I went to... Uh, LA Community College for about two weeks and just said, this is ridiculous. I know what I'm going to do. So you find yourself at the comedy store Mitzi took you in? Yeah, I was really lucky. And it was too, because I was a crazy kid. I was really like, I had so much passion for it. I would do anything. I mean, I drove across the country, you know, and, and I just, I was there every day for seven, eight, nine years during the day and at night. Comedy was my life. As it so happened it, it was the, the right place at the right time. And I was lucky. She did take me in and it was a crazy time too, but I was lucky that I was there at that time. And, and then I was, I left and I was gone for many years and kind of got an incoming call. Hey, do you want to make this film about the comedy store? The only thing I'd really done with the comedy store is I had been on Mark Maron's podcast and He'd been asking me to do it for a while, and I really didn't, I, I wasn't really doing any podcasts or anything like that, and I had this novel out. I said, okay, I, I'll come on, but I want to talk about the novel. I don't really want to talk about the comedy store, because it seemed to me that Mark was kind of stuck in the past, wanting to talk about the comedy store and all these, all this stuff, and it seemed like whenever I talked to anyone from that era or any comedians, they were all kind of stuck in the past, and I wasn't really thinking about comedy that much anymore. You know, that was like talking about going back to your high school, if you know what I mean, you know? Sure. I had this great time talking to Mark. And then uh, I made this movie with Kevin Costner, and we were having trouble casting a part. And the guy that was building my house was a friend of mine, and he kept saying, hey, do you know this guy, Bill Burr, on YouTube? I said, no, I never heard of him. Well, I thought you liked Mr. Comedy. You all know all the comedians. I go, well... I don't know the YouTube comedians. We, were, we had this part. It was a really good part. It was a big part. At the last minute, we were about a week away from shooting. Jason Sudeikis was a couple guys had fallen out, and then Jason Sudeikis couldn't do it. And Bill Burr came out on Conan one night. I was watching him at the room down in New Orleans. And I called Kevin. I said, watch this guy. This guy's funny. I've heard about this guy. And he liked him. So I called him. I said, come down to New Orleans and do this part. He had been on like one thing. He had done Breaking Bad. And we became really good friends. And when the movie came out, we did a press thing on Sunset Boulevard. And afterwards, we went to the comedy store and it was packed. And I thought, wow, because it had been like a dead zone for years. And I guess because I went in that night, I, don't, I think they thought of me to do this film. So they called me and it took me back. It really, you know, since then, I've really kind of gotten back into stand-up. I've fallen back in love with it. Not that I do it, because I don't, but I'm doing so much involved with stand-up again. It's really become a big part of my life. I, you know, I just did Bill's new special, and Bill and I just produced this guy, Brian Holtzman, special on him, and we're doing, I have a new platform coming out all about stand-up and Got three books coming out, you know, I and mean, we're just really doing a lot of stuff on stand up 
based on just on my love for it. That's awesome. Yeah, Bill Burr was great in Black or White. He was really good. Yeah, he was really good. He's a good actor. He's a, he was great in The Mandalorian. He kills it every time he's on Saturday Night Live. He's an excellent actor. And he was really good in Paper Tiger, the, the special I, we did in, in um, London at the Royal Albert Hall. Did you ever see that? I haven't seen that yet. Oh, you have to see that. It's unbelievable. That's his, I think it's his best special. He has a new one we just did. We just finished up in Denver at, at the Red Rocks. Oh, wow. That's be, I've been there. I mean, I haven't been at a show there, but I've been there and you know, I've climbed those rocks. That's a beautiful place. Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians right now. He's amazing. Me too. I think he's incredible. You know, when I was a kid in Detroit, one of the things that really, you asked me, really got me kicked into the whole thing was George Carlin. And he reminds me of George Carlin. Yeah. Yeah, him and Robert Klein. Those are the two guys that I loved. And Bill seems like the most in that vein. It's just a guy standing there just talking. And he's also so prolific. Yeah, he's he's amazing. This new special he's got coming out is it's genius. He's got stuff in there that is so intelligent. All right. Well, I can't wait to see that. Speaking of Kevin Costner, is he like your guy? Because that was the second movie you made with Kevin Costner, Upside of Anger also. It is sometimes directors have people they like to work with. Yeah, I like to work with him. I like, yeah, I do. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I guess you got to ask him, (laughs) you know, but I like to work with them and we get along. And I mean, my writing, he does a good job with my writing. Yeah, he does a great job. He was great in both. Uh, I love uh, Upside of Anger and Black or White. He he was great in both of those. Thanks. Yeah, he, uh, he was, he's a good guy too. You know, he's, he's very real. I kept wanting to yell at him to stop drinking in black or white. I mean, I'm sure that was the yeah. point, but like, <laughs> yeah. so he was doing great. Well, you should see him in real life. He's a goddamn drunk, Jeff. <laughs> no. Oh, uh, man. So, all right, let's go back to the comedy store. So you're at the comedy store. One of my favorite tidbits from the documentary is that you babysat Polly Shore and his, his brother. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I did. So... How did you pick, like, that was the time frame that you were going to pick? Because there was an era before that. There was? Was there? Is that when it started? It was around before that, right? Well, when you're when you're a narcissist, everything starts when you get there. <laughs> no, I meant, right. From your point of view, if, right, you had started from when you were there because you're making the movie, which is totally But But no, it started, it probably started about two or three years before I got there. Okay. And I covered some of that, but it, it really, uh, that was uh, what, Showtime wanted me to do, you know, they wanted me to make it really personal. It was, it was extremely personal. I, I didn't know most of that about Freddie Prince. The Sam Kinison stuff was really interesting. Was it difficult because it was, you're going back so far. A lot of it was kind of voices over images that you had to pick. And, you know, so just kind of picking the, the narrative and the stories of what you kind of focused on for the documentary. Yeah, it was strange. And, you know, listen, it's like, there's a lot of personalities, and the comedy store, even there now, is just a hotbed of incredibly talented, incredibly gifted, intelligent morons, you know? Even back then, we were always stepping on each other's feet on our own. Comics sometimes can't help themselves. And going back, at first, I was tiptoeing around, and then I got real loose, and then I real, then I started bringing Letterman and Leno and Jim Carrey and everyone back, and... I realized we were all playing the same roles we played back when we were just getting started. And then I started dealing with the Rogans and the the new people, the the Whitney Cummings and the Elizas. And and they all had their kind of perks and personalities and same way that everybody did back when I was there. And you knew who you had to tiptoe around and, and who was a bully and who was great and who you could kind of just kind of go, oh, just stand here and say this line. It just was the same exact thing. It was the same group of psychosis, jar of psychosis. But at the same time, they were really wonderful people. Eliza said it the best. She said, you know, it's like an old boyfriend. You know, I drive there. I go, what am I? I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get there. I get there. And then I go home and go, I'm never going back there again. <laughs> but then I can't wait to get back there. And they're really wonderful people. But we're all so flawed and just so much into our head and thinking about what we're doing and what we're creating and what we're, that it, it's an odd place. And it also, something about the darkness of the place and how big it is and the specter of Mitzi and 
it just, it's never going to be much different. It's just going to have a different group of comics. And I will also say that what I thought was very interesting was you come back and you go, well, well, when I was here, that was the golden age. You know, you'll never, you'll never duplicate Robin Williams and David Letterman and Jay Leno and da da da. That's the Marvel. It's the golden age. You know, and then you go, bullshit. These people here, Bill Burr and Rogan and Chappelle, and this, this is the golden age. And there's a new group coming up that are as good as this group, if not better. Everyone wants to believe they were part of the golden age. But yeah, it's fun watching all these new people emerge. I remember I met Eliza once for five seconds. She was opening for my friend J. Chris Newberg in Detroit at the Comedy Castle. This is before she was on Last Comic Standing. And so it's fun, though, when you you meet someone, you see someone, and then you watch their trajectory, and they become one of the, the biggest people. That's what I always thought was interesting about comedy is you meet so many people and you work with so many people and then so many of them can become super famous. It's just always a great, and then you say, oh yeah, I worked with that guy. I knew them. <laughs> it was fun. Also, what's great about it now is that you guys all have your own world. You can create your own world. You know, I always say it like we would come into the club, who's here? Who's here? Who do, you know, who's in the audience, you know, just in case we could get discovered or get on a show. And people come into the clubs now in the cellar in New York and they don't care who's there. They're too busy. Their minds are going a mile a minute. You know, I got my podcast going and I got this and I got a tour I got to start and I got to go out and play in this club. And they're just you guys are in charge of your own destiny in every way. And you know this better than I do, Jeff, the way you're doing, you know, I mean, you're just making your own shit happen, you know, and it's fantastic. And I think it's just the tip of the iceberg of the way that's going to happen. I think we haven't even begun to see the platforms that are going to exist for comics to be able to just do anything they want. And I say that all the time, you know, you will get to the point where, if you build up a following and you have make a movie and a and hundred thousand people around the world that you've built up fans that will buy it, you got a hit. You got a huge hit. You don't have to listen to anybody, a studio. You don't, you know, you just make your stuff and you make it good. And then you make the next one and you make it better and better and better and better. Yeah. And it's an amazing time right now, even just to be alive. I mean, just to like with technology to be able to do things and get it out there and like for comedians to do an entire special and just listen jeff i'll tell you what an amazing time this is we're about a minute away from the fact that we'll be able to take this whole interview and you'll be able to take a thing like a, called a mask or a green screen and get rid of that clumpy black curtain behind you right, <laughs> right. you'll be able to just get rid of it in post oh i'm kidding <laughs> You don't like my shower garden? <laughs> my light blocking shower garden? I keep waiting for your mom to come out and just beat the hell out of you with a pan. My office is amazing, except for the angle that the camera sits on my computer. Every other angle I've got, I got an amazing vinyl collection over here, the wall of eight by tens over there. You've hey, got a very hey. nice picture behind you and a lovely yes. window. <laughs> <laughs> hey, very soon you'll be able to just, t- I'm, I'm teasing you. <laughs> Oh, man. Hey, listen, it's not a lot better than my, my dead wall to the neighbors right there. You have a lovely uh, shrubbery growing up your window, though, Mike. I got Willie Horton. Yes, that's, a, that's lovely. That's a nice shot. Looking at a picture of Willie Horton. But I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's amazing because, like, my son is 27. He just made a, a little movie. It was unbelievable what they did. Him and his friends from Emerson and... A couple of my buddies let them use some equipment and stuff, and they made it for nothing. You look at a low-budget movie. Like when I started, I made these low-budget movies, and they looked like crap. And I look at Sam Raimi's low-budget movies, and they just look like crap. This thing looked, it looks beautiful. And they're editing it on laptops and stuff. They look like unbelievable. Mark Norman, you know Mark Norman? No. Oh, you got to get into Mark Norman. you got to get into Mark Norman. I love this guy. He's going to be so big. I'm going to write that down. Mark Norman. Mark Norman. He's unbelievable. He made his own special called Out to Lunch. 
He put it up on YouTube and on YouTube, he's got it on every site, but on YouTube alone, he's got seven and a half million views. Wow. And he made, during the pandemic, he made all these little shorts running around town, New York. He just played with the empty city and they're fantastic. It's unbelievable. And I mean, we would just finish this um, special that we're doing for Brian Holtzman. Do you know who Brian Holtzman is? That name I know. He's the guy that was in the documentary that like the late night comic at the comedy store that everybody loves, the kind of nutty guy late at night. Right, right, right. And Burr and I just did a special for him. And, and we would use these incredible cameras. But I took an iPhone 13 the last day of shooting and I was using it. And then I just said, throw this into the edit. Can't tell which is which. That's awesome. I not tell, Jeff. I'm thinking, oh, why are we getting all these fucking expensive cameras? Next time, why don't we just shoot them with a bunch of iPhone 13s? It looks fantastic. We're not far away from that. And we're not far away from just, everything's just going to get a little easier. And it's going to be a little bit easier to find the people that want this stuff. And it's really going to be about how good is it? Nothing else. Nothing else. Let me let me ask you a question. I had a few questions. Why do you got to control everything here? I don't understand. <laughs> when it's your podcast, we'll talk about it. Now, <laughs> now, now you threw me off. Now I don't remember. <laughs> oh, so the interesting thing about the Comedy Store documentary, or one of the interesting things about the Comedy Store documentary was Michael Keaton. Because love Michael Keaton. Yeah. How long was he a comedian? I mean, like for 10 minutes before he just became like this amazing, like an acting, you know, got the working well, stiffs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I wouldn't say 10 minutes. But you know what I mean? Like quick. But it, but a few years. I mean, he was around a lot. He was around a lot at the store when I first got out there and everybody loved him. He was a great guy. He was really friendly. He was really funny. He got a sitcom right away, and then another one that failed. And you could just tell that he wasn't going to be around long. You know what I mean? Because he didn't like go on the road. He didn't, he just, you could see that it was like a stepping stone. And plus, his movie career took off. And then he didn't come back, you know, whereas like, like when Robin hit with Mork and Mindy, he was back every night, every, you know, whenever he was around. But Michael just never came back. I really had to twist his arm to get him to do that documentary. He was like, oh, you don't, I don't want to do this. Why are you doing this? Why are you forcing me to do this? I, I, I said, and then I finally said to him, I said, you're going to really, when you see this finish, if you're not in it, you're going to be bummed out. I said, we're all, everybody's in it. And he was great in it. And even the day we shot it, once he got there, he was so glad to be there. And he called me from the car on the way home. I'm so glad I did that. That was so much fun. Oh my God, you were so right. And you know, I've known him over the years because he lives in my neighborhood or he lived in my old neighborhood. We moved recently. He just felt like, why do I want to do that? I, just, I, I get Letterman and Leno and I get Richard Lewis and I get everybody else, Whoopi. And, but I'm not, I was, I was such a short time about my life. And I said, you're going to be one of the most interesting parts of this. He was, because I, I didn't, I don't know if I knew he was a stand-up. I mean, I knew he was hilarious. I mean, a buddy of mine, when we were just talking about him in Night Shift, <laughs> like that's how funny he was in that. That was uh, uh, that was a cool part of the of the documentary, like the, that little that little surprise. Some of the people you assume. Oh, you know what? The other story I loved was uh, Freddie Prinz trying to kill John Travolta. <laughs> Crazy, right? Wow. I, I felt bad for the guy that everyone thought he used his gun. Yeah, they still think it is. Who in the documentary, like when you were there and like David Letterman's there, he wasn't David Letterman yet. Like like Sam Kinison, no, I think know. like like Sam Kinison, when you tell the story, you can tell, oh, he was a doorman, Mitzi put him on late, then he hit and then he was just huge, right? So that trajectory you can see. Who there was like, took, that you worked with, that like took some time and then ramped up? You know, like how, how fast, how much was Jim Carrey around before he became even the version of what he is today? Oh, no, all of them. Jim Carrey was nobody when I met him. Nobody. I mean, I was bigger when, than Jim Carrey when we met. Awesome. I'm not kidding you. No, I believe you. Jim would play the comedy castle in Detroit. He would open for me. and he would. It was the opposite story you told about Coulier. He'd go, hey, man, hey, this is what I loved about Jim, though. It was so common. He'd go, hey, Mike. Hey, hey, Jim, how you doing? 
you're going to be around for my act? And I'm thinking, oh, well, he wants to see me to watch and give him some notes. Yeah, sure. No problem. He goes, okay, can you, can you work my tapes for me? <laughs> you want me to work your tapes? <laughs> yeah, I need to work, run my tapes because I normally have a guy in Canada that does it. So I'm like doing Kermit the Frog tape on Golden Pond. You know, I got to get there early every night. And, you know, Jimmy's such a young kid. He was only like 17 or he didn't think anything. He just, okay. But you know what? He was such a good guy. I mean, that's how long we all knew Jim. We knew Jim from the very beginning. And and by the way, when I say I was nobody too, you know, I, I, but I was, at least I'd gone to LA and come back, but we were all brand new. You know, Howie Mandel would come down and, and Dave and Tim Allen was hanging out. Yeah. But Dave Coulier, I remember we were sitting at the bar at, at the Ridley's and he was telling a story about how he, I think he was saying he slept on Dennis Miller's couch. I think it was Dennis Miller. And, and then uh, he was talking about Tim. He was like, Tim, I, I have all these letters you wrote me from jail. <laughs> yeah. Want, they're amazing. Yeah. Do you want them? He's like, nah, nah. Yeah. It's just funny when hearing people like that talk about the people they just happen to know who now they're all super famous. You know, they're all. Yeah. <laughs> when Dave came out, he was my roommate. Dave was my roommate for several years. We had an apartment together. Oh, that's awesome. So here's a funny story. Well, I think it's funny. 10, 15 years ago or so, I was just starting to do comedy. And my stepmom says, Jeff, I've got a show for you. I'm like, oh, great. He goes, you need to send a VHS tape. So I'm dating it, right? He goes, it's Mike Binder. Mike Binder's putting on a show. I'm like, Mike Binder? Are you sure? How do you know Mike? He goes, Mike Binder, his mom, talking to his mom. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, Mike Binder. I go, Detroit Comedy Jam, Indian Summer? And he's like, she's like, yes. Well, it turns out it's Mike Young, not Mike Binder. But... <laughs> He's a pretty funny guy. Right. Mike Young, a great guy. And we're friends to yeah. this day from that. But the funny thing is I'm sitting there. One of the things I didn't get the gig. I remember I was at a bar mitzvah or a wedding. And I think it was Jessica Golden. She was standing there. Yeah. And she was talking about how she's opening for Mike Young when he comes to the Comedy Castle. I'm like, this is how I find out I didn't get it. I just happened to overhear her talking. Then I'm watching uh, Rain Over Me. And Jessica Golden's in the movie in the very beginning, she's a comedian bombing. <laughs> I just thought that was a funny connection. She's a good friend of mine. I don't really know her. I did one other event with her many, many, many years ago. So that was, it was just funny. It was just a funny story. I thought my stepmom was hooking me up to work with you. Turned out to be Mike Young. Went to Jessica Golden. And anyway, here we are 15 years later talking. But I've known Jessica her, pretty much her whole life. I know her really well. I know her family, Tamako. Are they Tamako too? Yeah, and her dad was pretty, it was a sexy specs. Uh, he's a pretty popular yeah. uh, guy here. I know them forever. My almost connection to you. So speaking of Detroit Comedy Jam, I was, I was doing some research on that. You did it many years, right? But you only yeah. taped it once? We only taped it once, yeah. I'm actually going to do another one. We're going to film another one, Howie and I and Paul and Dave. Oh, really? Oh, the same yeah. crew, the same crew from that. Yeah. I found it on YouTube. You had it on your one of your YouTube channels. I hadn't had it for years. And when we were doing the documentary, we digitized everything and they digitized that. The sound is wrong. I never did anything really with it. But I'm going to, I told you I'm doing this new platform and we're doing a bunch of stuff for it. And one of the things we're going to do is another comedy jam. That's awesome. I was... uh Googling, and I found this old article that said you had promised your backers that you could sell it to HBO, but then you couldn't. You were having troubles with it. And that George Carlin and his agent saw it and liked it and then helped you sell it to HBO. George did, yeah. It happened to be a good timing because Red Skeleton was supposed to have a special and HBO failed to deliver it for whatever reason. They needed a special. And there you were with the Detroit Comedy Jam. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what happened. But what really happened was George had a deal with HBO. We were doing a live show in Detroit at the Royal Oak Theater. And we sold out two nights, two shows. And there was a big article in the paper. And my brother Jack and I, we got all puffed up and we went over. George was doing a show at the, I think it was the, I think it was, uh, I want to say like the, uh, what amphitheater? There's an amphitheater. It's not Pine Now. Not Pine Now. Uh, I used to see George there all the time. The other one. Meadowdale or something? Meadowbrook. Meadowbrook. Yeah, that's right. So we were just, I just went to the back door and I basically said, hey, it's Mike Binder from Show Business. Can you tell George that I'm here? And, you know, here, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Free press story, pal. 
Are you in the free press Saturday? Were you? Were you? Then just go tell George I'm here. He, George, for some reason or other, he was so sweet. He let us in and we sat there with him for like an hour. He just talked to us and he was just the greatest. And I was like, he was my idol. He was my idol growing up. And he just, we showed him all the stuff about the comedy jam and everything. And he, uh, he ended up selling it to HBO for us. That's awesome. Yeah. You'll have to get Mark Ridley to bring you on stage again. I think he was the voiceover. Yeah, that's right. How'd you know that? That's right. Because I remember him telling me that many, many years ago. And then when I was re-listening to it, even though it's a younger version of his voice, <laughs> I texted him just to confirm. I'm like, that's you. That was you, right? Oh, yeah. Pop, Pops Ridley. <laughs> Did you call him Pops? Yeah, Pops. That's so funny. You're, how long were you at the comedy store before you're doing Make Me Laugh like 60 times? You got an HBO special, One Night Stand. How long were you doing all that before you kind of made your pivot and decided, I'm going to be a full-time storyteller in the medium of writer-director? Oh, that was a long time later. I, I was, all through my early 20s, I was doing talk shows and Make Me Laugh type stuff. A lot of stand-up, a lot of opening for bigger name acts and a lot of specials and stuff like that. And college tours. I did that up probably from the time I was 18 to the time I was like 26 or 27, something like that. I uh, went on this really great college tour with Steve Wright and Howie Mandel, the three of us. That was a great time. Wow. The Budweiser Comedy Store College Tour. And then I opened for, I think it was Gladys Knight and the Pips was the last thing I did in Vegas, which was like a cool thing. That does sound cool. Yeah, no, it was cool. And I quit to go to do the movie Coupe de Ville, which was my first movie. It just cut too much. But I was probably 29. When I was about 29, I just said, and I was married. Larry Bresner, who was at Rollins, Joffe, Martin Bresner, he was, he produced Coupe de Ville. And he was really like, kind of like, he was my manager, but he was my mentor, you know? And he just was like, you got to, you're doing too much. You're doing too many things, which has always been my problem. It always was my problem. I was supposed to go to London to do this BBC special. He said, you should be on the set of Coupe de Ville. It's your first movie, your script. It's, all I said was rehearsal for this big part. And I said, I, I got to go to London. I, said, I love London. It's a big, big, big BBC comedy thing. I got Rick Overton to replace me. And I went and I just was one of those things where I thought, okay, I'm going to stay here all summer and just be here and be on the set of this movie. And from then on in, I just started making movies. It was like three years till I started doing stand-up again. By the time that point, it was like almost like the addiction wore off, if you know what I mean. Sure. Did you just shift the addiction though to like, oh, writing, directing, creating a movie? It's just so much more fulfilling. Oh yeah. For a few years, all through my 30s and 40s, I just, I was always doing some, making a movie a year or a TV show. It was constant. Because that's your thing, right? You like to write and you like to direct sometimes star in your own stuff. You like to, everything's a film by Mike Binder. I, I love that. Yeah, I, it was for a long time. It was for a long time. And then, and then another shift came, you know. Everything's changed. You gotta, you gotta be really willing to change. I just wrote this book about it. And a lot of it is, on one level, I, I didn't make a mistake because I love, I love my career and I love my life. And I've been able to get so much done. But I probably think, you know, when I'm writing a book and talking about why some guys made it much bigger and some guys have careers and some guys don't, you need focus. And that is one of the problems I had. And it is one of the problems that I think that will come to new guys today. When you can do too many things, you do too many things and you don't focus. Bill Burr focuses. And he did focus for years. He just became a great comedian. And now he gets to go, oh, people come to him. You want to act. You want to direct. I didn't stay focused long enough with my stand-up. And you have to kind of, you can't be all over the map. You have to kind of be, a, you got to sharpen the tip of your spear and get it really sharp. And then just lunge. Because if you don't, when you finally lunge, show business just gently steps to the side every time you fail. And look, I get up. When I fail, I get up and I get another movie made. But it's it's hard. Whereas if you lunge and you lunge with precision and you have your movies, you have a big hit. It's there. 
you're Barry Levinson for four, five, six, seven movies in a row, people know exactly what you do. But when you're jumping back and forth, uh, I'm an actor, I'm a comedian, I'm a writer, uh, I, I diaper kids for a living, you know, whatever. you got to be really careful. And I think that that is one of a problem that I think is going to come to a lot of new guys because they can do so many things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Jack of all trades, master of none. Right. But it's also about doing what makes you happy, right? And it sounds yes. like, you know, you're fulfilled with the, the movies that you have. You have quite a, what is it, repertoire? <laughs> I've been very lucky too, you know? I mean, I've been really lucky. I've been able to, by and large, I never really worked for anybody. You know, I just do my own things. Do you get your movies self-financed? Is that? No, not really. But for the most part, except for a couple times when I worked on like Ray Donovan or Billions or something, or Nashville, I, I don't really, um, I'm always doing something I created. So when I'm a cre the creator of it, people, have the, if they've signed up to finance it or signed up to star in it, they know I'm in charge and I, I cut something in my head that they're trying to help me get out. No, I mean, that's, I, I think that's, that's great. Can I ask you a couple of questions about a couple of your movies? Yeah, sure. We talked about Tamakwa earlier. That not only has Sam Raimi in it, it was very funny and you don't really think of as an actor. He's a well-known director, but you went to camp with Sam Raimi at Tamaqua. Is that right? Yeah. Were you friends with him in Michigan also or just like camp buddies? Yeah. We were always friends. Yeah. Okay. Still to this day. So yeah, sometimes you have camp buddies and then sometimes, you know, they, you know, you live in different places, you know, that kind of things. He was pretty funny. He doesn't seem to, to act much. I met Sam Raimi one time at a, we were at a Shiva. So I was trying to be respectful of the fact uh, I see Sam Raimi and I'm like, is that Sam Raimi? By the way, he loves it when people come up to him at Shivas. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of like exploding inside. And then I see Ted Raimi. I'm still very. Great guy. He was in one of my movies. Yeah. He played, uh, I think a lawyer, right? Yeah. He's a great guy. So the universe rewarded me for being chill and I'm standing downstairs. They're doing a ceremony and Sam Raimi comes and literally stands shoulder to shoulder with me. I turn to him. I say, I'm sorry for your loss. He says, thank you. And he puts out his hand. And he says, hi, I'm Sam Raimi. And I said, hi, I'm Jeff Dewaskin. But in my head, my head's exploding. I'm like, of course you're fucking Sam Raimi. They're like Spider-Man. I mean, it's just like, I'm going, I'm dying inside, but I'm trying to keep real cool <laughs> on the outside. I'm like, he's like, I'm Sam Raimi. I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I was just like, <laughs> it was a real geek moment for me. <laughs> it's really funny. He's a, a wonderful guy. Yeah, real nice. So, well, speaking of Sam Raimi, the, uh, as I was watching some of your movies, I noticed the Indian summer, you have Wakanda, the Indian god of summer, Wakanda. And then, uh, and Spider-Man's part of that as well. Not only Sam being in there, but that's the, the club that they're in. And then in Rain on Me, Don Cheadle's reading a Captain America book and making fun of the Falcon costume in the comic book. And then in black and white, Anthony Mackie, who's the Falcon, is in there. Practically predicted the entire MCU through the series <laughs> of Mike Binder films. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. It's a funny story because Avi Lerner, you know Avi Lerner? Yes. He, he's the guy that owned Marvel and produced the Spider-Mans that Sam did and everything. He's like, you know when I knew Sam would be the perfect guy to do Spider-Man? I go, yeah, when was it? Goes, when I saw the whole thing with the painting Spider-Man on the wall at Indian Summer. Hey, that was me. <laughs> That was just the guy falling on his ass every time he got on the boat, okay? It was so funny. That's so funny. He goes, I knew that when I saw his love for Marvel and Spider-Man. Okay, Avi. What could have been? And now he's doing Doctor right, Strange, we're at too. Sam's house for dinner. This is when I knew. But <laughs> anyway, we were obsessed with reading comic books at camp. And we used to, they were, they were always drawn on the walls and shit. And also, uh, you can't see it, but in the walls of my office, there's all kinds of old, rare comic books all over the walls here. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Silver Surfer number one. Just some amazing comics all taped on the wall in bags. You're hardcore. Oh, I was when I was a kid. I was. So was Sam, but I really was. That's really cool. Oh, let me ask you a question about your time at Tamaqua. I read this in, uh, I think, the same article I was talking about earlier. Chevy Chase? Was your counselor or a counselor? Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Where did he grow up that he was? He was from back east. A girlfriend took him there. But Ronnie Weiss, I'm sorry, Ronnie Weiss, a guy that we all knew, met him in New York, living in New York. And he had him come up for the summer one summer. That's funny. Did people like him? Yeah, everybody loved him. He was great. Had long hair and he was, had a big dog and a beautiful girlfriend. And she was up there with that summer too in the girls' camp. And he was great. He was talented and funny. And that place had a lot of, I mean, Gilda Radner was there. And there was a lot of comic talent there. You, you reflected this in the movie Indian Summer also, but the people that started Roots, the um, yeah. the apparel company. Michael Budman, Don Green. But we did a lot of comedy shows. There was a guy named Dave McBrien that was so funny. Genius. And Dave Stringer. We used to have a radio show. Dave McBrien and I did on Dave Stringer's radio show called Cat and Camp and his little buddy Beaver. And it was like just like a radio comic show. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah, it was great. Every day at lunch. So you kind of got your start doing comedy at Tamaqua. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let me see. So your movies, one thing I did know is about your movie, you you attract like amazing talent. You have amazing casts in your movies. Indian Summer, you had Alan Arkin, Bill Paxton, Elizabeth Perkins, Diane Lane. I mean, just to name a few, Kevin Pollack, been in a couple of your movies. Tavia Spencer, Anthony Mackie, we mentioned, Joan Allen. Love Upside of Anger, by the way. Thanks which uh, I did want to make a joke that like the West Bloomfield address on his drive on the, on the husband who died. the address was wrong. It's a Birmingham address, but. Okay. Argyle. Was that what it was? <laughs> yeah, Puritan uh, Avenue. Oh yeah. It's just, you know, it's like, it's nothing I would notice, but it was just, I'm watching it and I saw West yeah. Bloomfield. So I'm like, I paused it and I'm like, wow. Cause I was curious if it was a real address. So I was like, uh, but I'm like, mm. I love how in all your movies and stuff that you're like, moved to LA and that's where you started all your comedy, but all your movies are so rooted in Detroit and have such Detroit kind of themes, like an upside of anger, 101, uh, riff 101 with Arthur Penthouse that I thought was one of your better acting. Like I enjoyed that version of Mike Binder, that swarmy character. I thought that yeah, was yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> if I may say, if I may be so bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite movie that you've done of the a film by Mike Binder? What's your favorite? I, I like that one. I like that one. A lot. Upside of anger? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I really like that one. I like this one I'm about to make. This one I'm doing with Carrie Russell that I'm really excited about. You know, so I like to think forward. I rarely watch anything I've done again, but I do like that one. Was it Carrie Russell in Upside of Anger also? Yeah. She was one of the daughters, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what movie I just watched yours that I thought was hilarious it was uh, Sex Monster with Mariel Hemingway. Yeah, I like that one too. That was fun. The cautionary tale of successfully talking your wife into a three-way. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. We had a really good time making that. I'll tell you the movie that I really liked, I think was one of the most successfully made movies of mine, and it bombed horribly, but it is really, people love it over the years, Blank Man. Oh, with Damon Wayans? It's the only movie I ever made that I didn't write. Just directed it? Yeah. And, you know, I just finished Indian Summer and it actually came out. And Indian Summer did well at the box office for the first few weeks. It was made so low and, you know, people were all excited about it. And Damon asked me to do it. And, you know, I love Dark Man, Sam's movie Dark Man. Dark Man was great. One of my favorite movies. And, I love the idea of creating your own superhero. And I loved the Batman show as a kid. So, and I love the idea of kind of spoofing it, but also creating it. And Damon and David Allen Greer together, I thought was so great. And we made this movie and it did, it was so funny. And it was really one of the best years of my life working on that movie. We laughed so hard. We, and all my agents and managers just said, don't do it. You're on a roll. You know, everybody in Hollywood loved Crossing the Bridge. Everybody loved Indian Summer. You're like, they're thinking of you like in a really cool way. This will bomb. Damon's hard to work with. You don't want to, you know, and I was like, this is like producing a friend's album. <laughs> you know, it, what? It, no one's going to hold it against me. It tested through the roof. Audiences loved it. They came out and the movie bombed so bad i mean it, the theater is so empty you could have killed somebody in the theater and nobody would have seen you do it that would be the perfect place to commit a murder i'm telling you my career was it was like taking me into a field and shooting me as a director for three four or five years four years right. it was exactly what they said was going to happen but i didn't think like that back then i didn't know that that's 
because I was just a comedian who started making his own movies. I took all the brunt for it. <laughs> Damon went on and made five movies in that in five in those years, you know. But I loved the movie, and over the course of the years, that movie has become such a hit on cable and on internet and kids dress up like blank man on Halloween. And I mean, it's amazing how big that movie's become. I haven't seen it, but I will, I will hunt it down. I will find it. I've seen a million of other ones, but not that one. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I don't, you know, listen, it's a very niche audience. <laughs> I have one other question. What was it? Um, what was it like working with Spielberg and Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Yeah, I'm going to let you off the, clip, off the hook here. You, I make one black theme movie and you can't be bothered to watch it. And you know why? White supremacy. That's why. No, Black or White was a, a, a black theme movie. I know, I'm kidding. All my <laughs> movies. Hey, listen, I've, I've always loved to work with black actors, black Writers, everything. I just no, it's right. There's, uh, yes, you you do a great job in that. I've always had. I, I mean, I, it, it's I, I, you know, one of the things about being a stand-up comic when we started, you know, at the comedy store. It's funny when the comedy doc came out. Some guy wrote on IndieWire this review, or I, maybe it wasn't IndieWire. I don't know what it was. Some oh, you know, it's a thing. This documentary is all about how. A bunch of white guys where the kind and I'm like, what is he talking about? The comedy store, Mitzi Shore was into diversity 25 years before anybody else. You know, there was Richard Pryor, Paul Mooney, Jimmy Walker, Freddie Prinz, you know, Whoopi Goldberg. I mean, it, the comedy store was all about who was funny and the Wayans brothers, and, and comedy is like that. And we were all friends with all my friends were. It wasn't, we were our own minority. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, totally. I hung out with black guys, Mexican, whatever. Who, it was about who was funny. And I, and very young, from, from 17, 18 on, I never, I always just thought about talent and about hanging, you know? I never, I wasn't, I wasn't in a segregated society. I think that's unique to comedians. I think comedians that hang out with comedians just see them as people putting in the grind, the talent. You don't see color. You don't see necessarily gender. It's just, you're just all in it and you're having that shared experience and you just, you mess with each other. You do, you have fun with each other and it's like, it doesn't mean anything. And you walk on stage and you do your thing. That's right. I said, what were you saying about who? I was going to ask about working with Steven Spielberg on Minority Report because as a, as a director, it must've been great to kind of be directed by Steven Spielberg. That's what I was going to ask. Well, I have not enjoyed working with the Jews. <laughs> it's been a problem for me. No, yeah. <laughs> of course, that was amazing. And it was just another one of those incoming calls. You know, I was in that movie, The Contender, uh, Rod Lurie's movie, and he was distributing it. And I was playing poker with Rod Lurie one night. And he goes, you know, Steven Spielberg came in the editing room and we were watching it. Things, you were in a scene and he asked me, Who the, who's this guy? And I went, yeah, I'm sure he did, Rod. <laughs> he goes, no, he really wanted to know all about you. About a week later, my assistant says, uh, hey, Steven Spielberg's on the line. I went, no, that's Rod Lurie. He's fucking with me. <laughs> he goes, well, she said it was Steven Spielberg. So you should take it. So I go, yeah, Hi. Steven Spielberg wants to talk to you. I go, okay, that's wonderful. Put him on. And Steven Spielberg gets on. And I go, hi, how are you? I'm just playing around. And then I realized, God, that's really Steven Spielberg's voice. <laughs> he goes, hey, man, I want, I'm doing this movie, Minority Report, and I want you to I want you to play a role. I got a really cool role in it for you. Can you come over to the office tomorrow? And just I just want to talk to you about it. You don't have to read or anything. I just want to meet you. Say hello. Okay. All right. So I hang up and I tell, call Rod. I go, you want bullshit. And so then I go and I had this great meeting with Spielberg and Rod's office was at Universal too. And Spielberg goes, by the way, I think you owe Rod Lurie an apology. He's waiting for you over in his office. <laughs> I told him, right? So I go over to his office and his assistant goes, and he's in the middle of the room, just in a chair. <laughs> All the desk has been moving side. He goes, sit down. What do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But he was great. Stephen was great in that movie. That was that was incredible. And and then I wrote a I wrote a movie for him to direct. And I worked with him for a long time on it. 
And at the last, last minute, it was a very personal movie. And at the last minute, he called me up. I was in London working on something else. We had budgeted and everything. It was, and uh, he said, I can't, I'm not going to do the movie, Mike. My wife talked me out of it. She said, it's just, she doesn't want me to do a personal movie about me. It was it had to do a lot with someone in show business attacking someone in show business, like a person, a stalker, right? Right, right, okay. He said, but, but you can do it. You can direct it and we'll make it here at DreamWorks. That's cool. And um, so I started to work on the movie and then it's a long story, but I ended up using Ben Affleck and he didn't want me to use Ben Affleck. And ben Affleck's career went cold and he had done a movie that bombed for them. And is this before or after Goodwill Hunting? Oh, no, this was long after. This is after Geely. Oh, after Geely. <laughs> so Lionsgate put the movie out in a bomb, but it was it was a crazy movie. But it was fun writing it with Steven. That's very cool. Did he help move along Mind of the Married Man? Did I, did I read that somewhere? Or? No, he was. He just loved it. He uh, would call me every Monday after watching it. You know, there was a while, it was Band of Brothers, then Mind of the Married Man, then Curb Your Enthusiasm. He would just, he just, he just loved it. You know, it was, it was, when I was making Minority Report, I showed him the pilot. I told him about the pilot and, and I figured he'd watch it. And then one day at lunch, he comes back. I watched it at lunch in my trailer. It's fucking great. And he called Chris Albrecht at HBO and told him how much he loved it. That's awesome. Yeah. Are you still in touch with him in any way? Yeah. No, not okay. as much as I used to be. But oh, that's cool though. But I, yeah. In fact, they just called me about to do a small part in his new movie. Oh, which one is he doing? It's like an autobiography of his younger life. Oh, okay. But I, I just couldn't because Got it. Got it was, I just didn't like the part and it just, and I was busy. I was so busy doing some other things and it just, I, I don't know, you know, I'm just not in that head anymore, but it was nice. It was just, a, it was just a kind of a. Do you like acting? Not really. You've done a bunch of it. You're just phasing out of it. You'd rather just write and direct. Yeah. Were you not in Indian Summer because it was just one of your it was one of your yeah. earlier movies? I was just trying to get my my head straight. Got it. And then I did have a question about Sex Monster. And this is just, this may just have been, you wrote it for the way the plot needed to work out. But did they not do anesthesia, 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 anesthesia with colonoscopies back then? <laughs> I mean, it made for a funny scene with Kevin Pollack, but I was just, I was like, oh my God, that's like how I thought it was going to be before I had mine. And I was like, <laughs> it was you just screaming. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't have been funny. No, okay. That's why I, th I thought like, all right, you just wrote it to me. <laughs> Having just gone through it, I had a different point of view. By the way, you know, with that, those cameras, wait a minute. I know what I'm, I don't know what I'm saying. They don't really knock you out for those cameras. I was out cold. You were out cold? I was so out cold that you could have paid me a million dollars. No, you're right. To, to, you're right. And, they do. And I couldn't they have proven that. or they even do. had any they recollection do. of having 10 feet of cord up my... No, they do do that. That's right. I don't think they did when I made that movie. <laughs> I don't think they did it quite like that. But I. But since then, you're right. I, they, they do. They just knocked you out. So, but hey, you got to work with Kevin Pollack again. So that was that was cool. You know, that movie was made so cheap. That office, his office, was in the living room of the house. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so funny. And when you worked on The Contender with Joan Allen, was that how you made the connection with Joan Allen? Yeah. As for Upside of Anger? Yeah. She was amazing in that. I know. I loved it. She was so good. She was so good to work with. So good. Her and Kevin Costner had good chemistry in that yeah, movie. Yeah, I, I loved her. I love her. I mean, yeah, she was. She was so great. You wrote that for her. I did. I wrote another part for her, but she couldn't do it. Different movie. Yeah, Rain Over Me. How much time do you spend kind of picking the music? Like Rain Over Me had amazing music in it. Is that a big part of your process? Is just picking the right songs? Yeah. And I work with this great guy, Dave Jordan. I've been working with him forever. My final question. I read a, something that said you actually turned down The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson as you were coming up. When I was young, yeah, I wasn't ready. First time they asked me to do it, I wasn't ready. And then when I wanted to do it, they didn't want me for a long time. Because you said no? Or no, was it just, no. they just couldn't work you back into the... No, no, it was just a different guy. And he didn't, you know. But when the very first time... It was kind of like a novelty kind of thing, you know, how young I was. But I, I ended up doing it. I ended up, you know, later. I just, the, the next time I wanted to do it, they were like, oh, no, you know, the stuff you're doing isn't right for Johnny. Uh, no, Johnny will love it. But I just didn't want to go on as like a novelty act. Like, oh, look, he's 17, he's 18 years old. Look at him. He's 19, you know, whatever I was. 
because I did it on Merv Griffin and stuff, and it was okay, but it doesn't, I didn't have enough to back it up. And also, at the time, I was really close with Leno, and he was, he was right. He was like, don't do it. Don't do it. You got six minutes at the most. <laughs> Oh, in case they had invited you back or something? Yeah. You would, you would, yeah. Got it. Looking back, do you think that was still the right? Would you have done yeah. it the same way? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't. I never had it. That period of my life, that was I had, That was right. All that stuff was right. All the talk show stuff. That, it never does anything for you, you know, unless you're like Seinfeld or somebody. And that's really what you want to do. But in the Comedy Store documentary, the, the, a lot of it talks about how, the whole connection with feeding Johnny Carson and then exploding and becoming. I was too young. I, I missed that era, to be honest. And unless I wanted to do be a sit, do a sitcom or, you know, I, I wanted to get an HBO special, which I did. And, and then, and, you know, a sitcom, which I did, you know, I, by the time I want was going on the Tonight Show, I would go sit down on the panel. But to have to come out and do six minutes every time and stand there like a, a paid monkey for Johnny. And the guys now, today, they don't even they don't even bother with that, those shows. They, you, do, you get more doing these shows. Yeah, you're going to blow up after this goes. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying? Like when Bird did Paper Tiger, he didn't even go on those shows. He did, he was promoting it. He did Rogan, you know, and he did Marin. And he, you know, I mean, it, you get so many more... Right, right. Yeah, they, because, well, Rogan and, and Marin, they have such a huge following. So when's the next Detroit Comedy Jam going to be? Oh, it's going to be not for a while. Probably, probably, We probably won't even get around to shooting it until next spring or next summer. When's your next movie? Probably we'll shoot it in the spring. Till There Was You. Is that the name of it? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I look forward to that. Is there a name for the site that you mentioned early on? It's going to launch soon, and I, I don't want to say it just yet. But it's, it's it, you'll like it. You'll like it a lot. It's really definitely, it's going to be fun for comedians. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Oh, where, where can people keep up with you on the social medias? Where do you like? I don't really, you know, I'm when this launches, I'll be all over it because I'm, we're going to open up something all over. But I have a, I have a Twitter thing, but I had to go off it for a year. My kids took me off it because I, I do nothing but get in trouble on it. And, <laughs> but I, I have a Twitter thing, but I, and I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on anything else. And I think I'm about to get taken off Twitter again. <laughs> so uh. <laughs> so I just, I'm not politically correct. And when I made the comedy store thing, they took me down for a year. All right. Well, all right, nobody found. I'm, I'm, I'm about to come out with it all. I'll tell you about it in about a month or so. It's really cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to I can't wait to hear about it. There's a lot to it. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been fun. Thanks for asking me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Been a big fan forever. So this was a joy. Listen, I want the site, your podcast, to get huge so that you can hire some really big, burly men to come over and move the desk so that the camera sees the really good part of, of your office. I've got a great vinyl collection. Not your grandmother's dress. <laughs> That's a shower curtain to block the light and my ketubah. And then, uh, I do have a nice vinyl collection. I do. I'm telling you, man. You see, now, why can't you sit that direction? Because the, the my my computer, when I bought the house, is like the cord is right there. So, and it's only like a foot long. So I have, I'm very limited to where I can be. I'm speaking now to Jeff's viewers and fans. We're going to set up a GoFundMe and we're going to give him an extension cord. All we're asking is for is $18. It's $18, but you won't have to look at that giant black moo ever again, okay? That's $18. Go fund me, Jeff's extension cord. <laughs> Mike, thank you so much. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. How amazing was Mike Binder? Definitely dive into his movie catalog. If you haven't seen the Comedy Store documentary yet, it is a must view, especially if you love comedy. If you love comedy, definitely head over to standupworld.com, sign up for the mailing list, and check out all the great content there. So during the interview, Mike twice made fun of me and joked about a GoFundMe for my backdrop. I know this is an audio-only podcast, but during the interview process, we can see each other. And so my desk was up against a window, and to block the window so that the backlight didn't ruin the camera, I had this horrible like Bed Bath & Beyond shower curtain. 
So Mike uh, called me out on it, and it's a, it was a horrible backdrop. It really was. I made no effort to have a good backdrop game. So anyway, after the interview with Mike Binder, I rearranged my whole office. I moved my desk. I redecorated and everything. So now, even though you'll never see that either, I've got a great backdrop when I do interviews for the people I'm interviewing. So maybe I'll, I'll put a before and after picture up so you can see what the shenanigans were all about. <laughs> Anywho, so no need to send money. Well, with the interview over, it can only mean one thing. That's right. It's time for a trending hashtag from the family of hashtags at hashtag roundup. Download the free, always free, doesn't cost a penny hashtag roundup app at the Google Play Store or Apple App Store and be notified every time a game goes live. Tweet along with us and one day one of your tweets may show up on an episode of Live from Detroit, the Jeff Tawaskin Show. Fame and fortune await you. Keeping with the theme of today's episode with comedian Mike Binder, we're diving into the catalog and reading tweets from a hashtag from the musical hashtags game on hashtag roundup, hashtag comedian song or band, the ultimate comedian song or band mashup hashtag game. Take a comedian, take a song, mash them together. Take a comedian, take a band, mash them together. The hilarity is endless. All right, here are some of my favorite hashtag comedian song or band tweets. Chris, rock you like a hurricane. A flock of sea goldmans. What does the red fox say? Kiss me, Mabley. What a great start to hashtag comedian song or band tweets. Here's some more. Richard Jenny and the Jets, Jets, Jets. Can't help. Fallen in love with you. Earth, wind, and Richard Pryor. Total eclipse of new hearts. Light my prior. 99 red fox balloons. 99 red fox balloons. Back in Lewis Black. Billy on the street, Eilish. Louie, Louie. Anderson. Mama and the Tom Papas. You can call me Ali Wong. These are awesome hashtag comedian song or band tweets. But we're not done. Bernie Mac the Knife. She's got Larry David eyes. Schumer of 69. I got my first real six string. Schumer of 69. We will, we will. Chris Rock you. Chris Rock you. Arsenio Hall and Oates. Chris Rock and Roll never forgets. Bernie Fleetwood Mac. Take another piece of new heart. All right. Sorry for the bad singing. Sinbad to the bone. And our final hashtag comedian song or band tweet, Mitch Hedberg and the Detroit Wheels. Oh, all right. Those are some awesome hashtag comedian song or band tweets. Head on over to at Jeff Dwoskin show on Twitter. Retweet all the tweets I read. Follow them, like them, show them some love. Well, with the hashtag over and the interviews over, it can only mean one thing. We're at the end of episode 102. I want to once again thank my amazing guest, Mike Binder, for joining me. And of course, I want to thank all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Jeff Dwoskin Show with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Now go repeat everything you heard and sound like a genius. Catch us online at thejeffdwoskinshow.com or follow us on Twitter at Jeff Dwoskin Show. And we'll see you next time.